My name is Bruce Joe. I work with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in Oxford. Uh, I've been there for 11 years. Uh, I've been working at Cal and just consultant for that. Um, so I've been fortunate to work uh, for 11 years doing natural resource damage assessment. Uh, also with the acronym NRDA. Uh, just to get a quick general sense of the room, how would raise your hand if you would consider yourself either an NRDA practitioner or if you have actively participated in an NRDA at some point in your in your job? Definitely several. Okay, that's good. Just choose this one. How many here have been involved in an incident that actually had an NRDA component, even if you were in it? Okay. Good go. Well, I would say almost most of you have And then the rest of you have given so I am Bruce Joe. I am the last one here on this list here. Uh, two top ones are the resource economy and Steve. Kathy is an attorney. She does handles almost all of our large energy cases in Oxford. Is this too loud? It seems very loud.
uh, it's really all to get to the restoration, which is the compensation for this bill. Ultimately, what we want to see is an increase in, in good habitat, so what we want to see is restoration. Here's a good example of turning this fairly barren field, it probably has some bacteria and and insects in soil in it, into something that looks more like, like this on the right. A nice wetland, productive, good, happy, healthy environment for, for wildlife. So what are the, some of the potential components of all spill settlements? And you'll see all of these wrapped up in the in all spill settlement. There's certainly fines and penalties, which are typically illegal in, in the legal realm, of which NRDA rests firmly within a legal, a legal construct. Uh, fines and penalties are meant to dissuade uh, from illegal activity or punish bad activity or illegal activity. Cost recovery, of course, is they have oil is a pretty expensive business. Anybody in this room probably knows that. Um, so ultimately, all the materials, all the, all the labor hours, everything like that has to be recovered. So the uh, spill settlements only include not only the fine penalties, but it's going to want to include the cost recovery of everybody's time and resources invested in, in the spill response. But then the third component is natural resource damages, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But there is yet another component. There are third-party claims. Um, one example would be commercial fisheries that get closed uh, are not handled in the settlements that Osprey would work on. So, for instance, a commercial fisherman that could, could go out and make his money and, and do his fishing activities would have to file a third party claim against the responsible party. And that would be outside of the most of settlement that our, our trustee would work on. Okay. <coughs> so, Thank you. 
deposit college and sort of been trained to do some of the economic, economic, economic stuff, but uh, Matters Steve would probably be better equipped to address that question. Yeah. So, do you, well, I'll talk to you after. Okay, so we'll talk briefly about some of the legal foundations, because like I said earlier, all of what we do in natural resource damages is definitely within a legal construct. Um, these are the main laws we've heard a lot about them already today. OPA 90 uh, deals with oil spills, circle, of course, mainly with hazardous materials. We do have some California laws. The Lever King Sea Strand Act is sort of our California version of OPA 90. OPA 90 is federal. Lever King Sea Strand Act. Is a California version. Um, and then we also have in our regular fish and game, regular fish and game code, we have 2014, 5650, and 2016. I won't get into the nuts and bolts and any great details, but essentially 5650 is the oldest pollution law on books in the state of California. Uh, I saw Brian here earlier, right? Isn't that correct, Brian? The oldest pollution law in California. It goes back to, I think, the 1860s or 70s, something like that. Anyway, we have a few other statutes that help us define when we can get involved in and pursue natural resource damage claims uh, under California law. So most people know natural resource damages from environmental impacts, oil birds, things that happen, uh, like the American trade oil spill that happened right here off of Southern California. Uh, oil birds uh, definitely were Things were found a lot of very expensive uh, real estate oil. But as was touched on by the question from the back just a few moments ago, there's also recreational use losses. Beaches get closed. People can't go take their walks for all on the beach. They can't walk their dog. They can't take their kids down to sand castles. They can't go fishing. You know, their favorite pier or jetty. Uh, they can't take their boat out to go enjoy the nice, you know, nice day in the water. So we'll talk a little bit about that and actually, from a monetary standpoint, sometimes the recreational use component of our natural resource damage claims are some of the biggest portions of, of the claim. Um, I think that was certainly true in cost And not all of our natural resource damage claims occur just in marine waters. We certainly work in freshwater cases. This happened several years ago, the East Walk River, but it was up in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And actually, this oil spill actually went out of California eventually ended up in, in the state of Nevada. Also, not all of our natural resource damage claims are pristine, pretty environments. Sometimes we work in concrete line systems. And you know, in the LA area, these are very important to wildlife because it's the last vestiges of habitat that some of these animals have to seek and, and utilize. And you can actually see, you know, there's birds utilizing this habitat. Though it's not necessarily all that scenic or pretty to look at. So, who are the trustees in California? The most active ones, the ones you'll see in pretty much any damage, any, any spill that has a damage claim component to it, are uh, NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and, and us, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. There are certainly others uh, that have uh, legal standing to be trustees. So, depending on where we're at in the world, California, or any other state for that matter. Uh, certainly National Parks, Bureau of Land Management, and state, and land, uh, state parks and state lands. Even the DOD and the tribes, as, as we talked about just a moment ago, uh, can and do get involved on occasion. So let's go through the natural resource damage uh, process. Of course, following the spill, we want to do data collection. Uh, you'll probably see natural resource damage teams Especially if you're out in the field doing your work, we'll be out there collecting ephemeral data. But even after the field is cleaned up, we'll very likely be out there sampling and maybe even doing studies long after the spill is cleaned up. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the injury quantification phase, how we, how we do the restoration scaling, how we use that data to figure out how much restoration should we do and of what type. And we'll talk a little bit about the settlement and restoration to follow up. We'll, we'll talk certainly about how, when all is said and done, we have implemented restoration. We want to see that there's a nexus back to the spill, so that we're, we're restoring the right things, the 
right places that match up to the injuries that were actually incurred during the spill. So this happens with your partial material. So let's move on to a few NRDA myths, because there certainly are plenty of them. We'll cover the sort of the major ones. Trustees are only interested in cash out subsidies. Um, the reality is most responsible parties are not in the business of implementing restoration projects. It's far field from their expertise and far from what they make their living doing. So they prefer generally to, to just turn over, you know, to, to do cash settlements and, and then allow the federal to implement the restoration project. But the reality is they, they have the right to implement their own restoration pro, uh, projects. Uh, some of them have approached us and, and proposed very reasonable and very valuable uh, restoration projects. We may want to impose or insist that there's be some sort of conservation easement uh, applied, especially if it's not on public land, to ensure that the benefits persist, but certainly uh, they, are, they are definitely allowed to do that. So some of the money is used to fund the trustee's own office or fill coffers during budget shortfalls. That is definitely not true. Uh, the, the money that we collect in the natural resource dam is, is pretty hard and fought money. Uh, it, it has a lot of legal requirements and it has to be spent on some very specific and targeted restoration projects. We'll, we'll cover some of that and show some examples of what's been done following the big school cases. So another myth, uh, NRDA is usually much more than the response costs. Raise your hand if you've ever thought that or, or, or you've looked at some of these damage and thought, millions of dollars, you know, that, that's huge. It turns out NRDA uh, claims are almost always dwarfed by the response costs. Cleaning and oil is a very, very expensive business. Um, I can't think of a big spill where any of our damage claims came close to matching what the response costs actually were. Um, NRPA is a black box of smoke and mirrors. It's this mysterious thing that's sort of a random number generated. They do studies and all of a sudden numbers dollar signs are disappearing out. There's no standard methodology for calculating. Every, it's certainly true that every spill is different, and the inputs to the methods we utilize are different, as they need to be, right, for, for every given circumstance. But there's actually quite well accepted methodologies for doing, you know, for instance, habitat or resource equivalency analysis, or habitat equivalency analysis. You may have heard those terms before. Um, each bird model for recreational use laws, travel models, and such like that. There's a very well accepted and standardized methodologies. The inputs for those methods of model. There's sometimes where disagreements and variability, but you definitely have very standard methods we employ. So some points to remember. Natural research damage is only one piece of an oil settlement. The term damage is a very legalistic term. It usually means money, but it can mean other forms of compensation as well. NRDA can apply to a pretty broad range of, of cases where resources of marine, freshwater, large, and small all sorts of different habitat types. But ultimately, the goal is restoration. So here we have a nice little picture of some diligent samplers getting down in there and collecting their samples. And we'll talk a little bit about what these graphics mean as we move through some of our methodology slides. So there is a spill, and there is a damage collection and injury quantification phase. During that phase is when we're out, and it's often while the cleanup is still underway, but often goes beyond that as well. Uh, we go out and collect tissue samples. We bring samples back into the lab and run special studies. And we try, we're basically we're trying to quantify what that injury is and how bad it, how bad it is. These are our central questions, of course. What will it injure? In a big spill, it can affect multiple habitats, right? You have a lot of impacts over water, seabirds, for example, but it can come ashore and oil a sandy beach, you know, a whole different habitat type. Maybe it can go into a lagoon and get into an estuary department where it had flats and estuary impact. So we can have all kinds of different things. So we want to know what was injured. We want to know how much, um, whether that be the number of animals, the number of acres, the, the linear mile stretch of, of sandy beach. We want to know what the, what the quantity is. And we want to know how badly injured and for how long. We also know, typically, from an oil spill, you know, there's going to be a recovery. It's not going to, generally speaking, be a permanent injury. Sometimes it can go on for, for, for many years, you know, but um, eventually there'll be a recovery. We want to know how long that recovery will take. So 
data collection during the spill, often we're going to use response data. Uh, you might actually see me on the SCAT team as well. That's one of my ICS uh, positions that I, that I get pulled into during the spill. We'll use SCAT data. We'll use all kinds of uh, uh, data that's collected by the response. We'll also use the investigation report. So typically there's a law enforcement will be doing their own investigation. And often that information gets folded into our NRDA. Because the last thing we want is our reports conflict with anything that's you know, part of the official investigative record. Natural resource damage sampling and surveys. We'll do a lot of our own surveys, as I mentioned before. Uh, sometimes you'll see us out on beaches counting encrusted organisms to quantify how much algae or something is on, on rocky shoreline. So uh, later activities include taking all of this individual data and trying to put it together. And we've got, we've got at least two, two economists in-house. NOAA has modelers and specialists who help us run different types of models. Um, and and quite, quite often, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have subsequent studies to look at impacts that were harder to study in the field. So now we're going to move on to the restoration scaling and damage quantification. So this is where we start taking the Results of all that uh, injury quantification and figure out okay, what, is, what does it mean? And how much restoration do we have to do? And just how do we translate? And I think that was somewhat buried in the question you asked earlier. How do we translate the injury quantification into compensation for the public? We'll do a quick flashback, and I think this has already come up once or twice this morning to the Santa Barbara Oil Spill that happened in 1960. Blowout at uh, platform A, oil all over the place. It's like two or three million gallons or something like that. It was. Maybe it was two or three million barrels. It was a, it was a large volume, but I was in diapers at the time, so I don't really remember. Uh, certainly significant wildlife impacts, uh, a lot of political interest, lots of uh, protest. Uh, anybody recognize this guy? I guess he even made his appearance. So they actually developed a price list uh, back then. And it's kind of interesting if you look. Each greed was worth $17.56. Kind of a simple method, but uh, this is what they did. Red rock crabs were 75 cents. Blood worm per quarter. This one kind of blows me away. $50 per liter of phytoplankton. I wonder how they estimated the total volume of impact on the planet. I could have got it to they apparently developed a list of over 850 values for individual species. But guess what? This is absolutely not how NRD is. <laughs> That's okay. Not quite so simple, just like a, a nice little shopping list with the prices. Bruce, 100,000 barrels. 100,000 barrels. That's a big one. So these days, it ultimately boils down to this simple balancing equation. The amount of injury on the left should be balanced by the amount of restoration on the right. So in this case, we're looking at acre years. Uh, so this, this habitat is going to be quantified in acres. And, and the time component is going to be factored in. So you have acre years of loss to the stroke must equal the acre years of gain from the restoration project. So if we look at this graphically, uh, it looks something like this. And this is going to be a sort of a very simplistic cartoon type example, but it gets this point across. So everything's going along well and good. And your, your resource services are, are here on the y-axis and time is here on your, on your x-axis. So every, everything's plot along on an initial level up until the spill. And of course, that's going to cause degradation and loss of natural resource services rather rapidly. Then, of course, as we talked about earlier, we're going to expect to see some recovery over time. And if we assume a sort of a steady, nice, steady baseline, which is probably simplistic, most environments have a somewhat noisy baseline, but if you assume sort of a static, flat baseline, you can bound an area here. So we call that our injury curve. We can actually you know, do some quantification on that. And we can also give credit for primary restoration. Primary restoration is any kind of uh, restoration actually done on, on the spill site itself. So if, for example, if you wanted to buy or remediate the, uh, the shoreline where right, there was oiling, you ran some rotor tiller, maybe you threw in some nutrients like you did in the marsh, and you, you allowed that oil to break down in that substrate a little bit faster. Uh, they can be 
credited, the RV would be credited for that. So actually what that little wedge, it, al it allows the, uh, the recovery to occur sooner, so your injury polygon gets a little bit smaller. So then what we want to do is look at, well, what kind of compensation, what sort of compensatory restoration project would we do for that? And we want to look at an area that had a degraded site where the resource services were initially low, but that after the restoration, the resource value was boosted up, and you assume a certain time frame. And what we want to do is make sure that the, the green polygon area matches the red polygon area. So essentially, that's what we do in, in our habitat equivalency or resource equivalency analysis to help scale the amount of damage. And what happens then is we look at the, the only way we get our, our dollar figure out of this is we say, okay, well, what does what is, what is it cost to implement that amount of restoration of that specific type? And that, that yields our dollar values. So what about human uses? So we talked briefly that you know people like to go to the beach as well. So beach activities, fishing, wildlife viewing, viewing as well as travel uses get, get uh, put into this category. So there's quite a bit of loss for those as well. We have uh, economic models that look at the value of lost user days. So sometimes we'll employ uh, overflights of our own. Sometimes we'll use some of the videography or photography from the overflights uh, to look at how many people are at the beach or how many people are not at the beach because of the spill. And we'll calculate things like the value of the diminished user day uh, as well. So we have specific methodologies. So a quick summary is we definitely have standardized methodologies for calculating our damages. You'll often see that we'll, we'll be out during the spill collecting a lot of that information and data. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later on about how we interface with the Unified Command because you probably understand by this point that natural resource damage is not part of the uh, Unified Command. We're actually separate uh, legally we need to be that way. So needed to break apart from the responsible party we could, but we interface with uh, the Unified Command through a very specific mechanism. Um, we often require additional information that, that goes beyond what's typically collected by the response itself. And our central question are what was injured, how much, how bad, and how. So I'll just kind of walk through a big spill case give you a flavor for what NRD looks like in a, in a big spill scenario. So here's some characteristics of a, a large spill. You're going to see multiple trustees. So you're going to see U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA. If, if there's parks there, both state and national parks, it could be their state lands as well as tribes, especially if it's on or near uh, tribal lands. You can typically see a cooperative assessment with the responsible party. Uh, in the 11 years I've been doing this, I can't think of a single large bill that we didn't work cooperatively with the responsible party. Uh, natural resource damage staff and multiple agencies are going to be present during this bill. There's definitely going to be hundreds of thousands of responders. You guys will probably be involved. And there will, of course, be a complicated spill organization. You can actually see that. Uh, Here's the NRD organization over here. We kind of interface through this natural resource damage assessment rep or NRD rep, which formally interacts with the uh, liaison. We'll talk a little bit more about that. You're going to see dedicated NRD staff there. Small spills, not usually, uh, that isn't usually the case. A lot of times the on scene biologists and regional biologists can handle it. Um, in a big event, you definitely going to see dedicated NRD staff on scene. And there's going to be intense public Here's our star. Everybody recognize this guy? It's Rob Roberts, right? That's... Who is it? That's Lizzie. <laughs> Feel the back. Okay, so here's the Unified Command. You guys are probably very familiar with this organizational structure. Ops, planning, finance, and logistics. <laughs> NRD has its own organization. It's all uh, codified in our policies within Osberg. Uh, and it's typically, it, it's how our NOAA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service counterparts are, are functioning, at least here in California. We set up our own wildlife impacts, habitat impacts in, in different 
subgroups within our organization. And we interact with quite a few, and this is really more of just an example, but all the red boxes are, are, are typically units that we're going to interface with pretty extensively and pretty regularly. And we do that through this NRDA representative right here. Um, formally, it, that inter, inter relationship links in through the liaison officer, but we, we, we're in constant communication with safety uh, and the information, as well as situation units, wildlife branch, of course, we get a lot of our wildlife data through the wildlife branch. And then the environmental unit, we're working with SCAT data a lot of, a lot of times, too. So coordination after the response. NRD tasks are typically done cooperatively among the, the trustees and the responsible parties. Like I said, these days, it makes very little sense, I think, for anybody to go off on their own and do their own studies we work cooperatively here. Uh, NRD settlements are coordinated with fines and penalties from multiple agencies into one global settlement. We're, we're trying not to have piecemeal settlements here and there for all the different parts. We want, we want one global settlement where it's all brought up together find the penalties, cost recovery, and impact research damages we talked about earlier. And the NRDA settlement is restoration project based. Again, emphasis on the restoration. And it can be a cash out or the RP can implement the you know, projects for themselves. So after it's all settled, it's all done, who, who monitors and ensures that these restoration projects actually get implemented? And the public is compensated for the losses that happen. That's the job of the trustee councils. So typically, you're going to see uh, an oversight trustee council form that's going to have one lead representative from each trustee agency that was involved in this bill. Typically, uh, all our decision making is done by consensus basis. And what, what the, the product you're going to see come out of that trustee council is a restoration plan. So they can get a little complicated sometimes, especially when multiple resources have been degraded during this bill. But we have to create the plan and put it out for public comment and receive that public comment and modify it as, as needed before we implement the restoration. So here's a large bill example, kind of walk through what all that means and what happened in the case of the motor vessels, IPC, which we talked about uh, earlier this morning as well. Previous uh, speakers touched on, on pretty much everything we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, so there was a marine spill in and around Humboldt Bay in 1999. It was a dredging vessel. Only had about 2,000 gallons of bumper fuel released, but um, over 1,250 birds were collected dead and dying, including several threatened endangered species, including marble marlettes. There's a photo coming up of that. Beach churches spent 20 days and covered 100 miles of coastline. And local, state, and federal agencies definitely worked part of that response. Quite a bit of public outcome. This happened actually a little bit before I came. Here's one of our oil marble mer merlets and TNE species. The estimate was that it was 135 leaves killed. And that was just from that roughly 2,000 gallons of marble About 1,600 uh, common birds killed. Uh, the trustee agencies worked in a cooperative manner with the RP and Keep in mind that the spill actually occurred in 1999. The consent decree for the settlement signed in 2006. When it came on board in 2003, they were sort of taking the settlement negotiations. We needed mediators and all kinds of stuff. It was a little bit of a difficult one, but they eventually got it. Got it. So here's an example of what the, the, uh, the elements, the components of the restoration plan look like. You can see on the left here some very discreet injured categories for reefs and looms. There's a little bit of lumping in, uh, going on here, but pelicans, cormorants, and gold are lumped together. Rocky seabirds, here's a marble marlin. There were some very special, we often get the question, what do you do for threatened endangered species? Are there, do they come in a premium, do they cost more? The reality is, if we have to do a restoration project that's very specific to restore, you know, something very particular about a human species, yeah, that can be more expensive, because in this case, we had to buy groves of redwood forest, because model of marlites, even though it's a seabird, turns out they nest only in the old growth redwood forest, of which uh, they're kind of expensive and quite much fast. So that was a, a very expensive component to this. Uh, wetland birds, water column, there was certainly with rocky or tidal habitat, beach, and human directness losses. So you can see the restoration category were, were 
set up to, to mirror injury categories. So they actually looked at, uh, did some nesting habitat projects to restore grebes and loons. More nesting and roosting projects done for cormorants and pelicans. Uh, rocky seabird projects. The model merlin projects that I mentioned earlier were, were redwood projects. Uh, the wetland projects compensated for several different categories. And there was dune, dune restoration done for the uh, snowy plover, which is part of the sandy beach habitat. And there were human recreational use projects implemented to, to supplement for the recreational use losses on that spot. Here's just sort of a general list of restoration project examples um, that have emanated from natural resource damage uh, claims. I thought this one was kind of interesting. Big South Cape Island, New Zealand rat eradication. Why, why would we implement, any, any idea, why would, why would we implement a restoration project in New Zealand for cow farms and bullets and all? Carol, you, you, you can't answer. Well, okay, okay good. <laughs> So we go into the nesting grounds, typically for birds. That's where you have the best opportunity to restore the population, right? At the nesting grounds. Help improve things there. In this case, get rid of rats who are chewing on and destroying their eggs. So it's amazing to eat in the city of travel like kind of distance, but they do the big nest in New Zealand and come kind of feed off the California coast. So that one always interesting. So over $200 million in restoration funds collected so far in restoration. So summary large bills for NRGAs. Lots of coordination challenges during the response. We have to work very diligently in the whole structure of the NRDA representative working through the liaison and making sure the safety of those work for our teams will be, make sure that all of them get the right safety information out to our field teams. That everybody's in coordination, we're not getting in anybody's way, we're not where we shouldn't be uh, for, for response reasons. You know, all that has to be worked out. There's pretty extensive data collection going on, long time between Bill and settlement, you saw the example Stuyvesant in the seven years. Relatively large settlements, and keep in mind these are definitely not the common spill. We work on a lot of small spills, and unfortunately, very few projects. So, we'll kind of walk through a little, a little more quickly what a small spill looks like. Uh, Becky Stan and myself have been doing a lot of small spills over the last several years, but uh, the resource economists do them do as well. So, what is a small spill? It's all most of elements apply. Typically, uh, the, the injuries are pretty limited in scope. Uh, typically, our agency is the only trustee agency involved. Sometimes we'll walk the borders of the LCP on scene. Uh, typically, the incident is a one-time event, typically not a chronic problem. It's not something that's happening over and over. And also, typically, it's not a big human recreational use loss uh, case. But we do want to emphasize we, we don't take on the really, really itty bitty spills here. It has to be worth our time to get involved. So we don't want to do something that's going to end up being a five hundred dollar settlement, right? And spend five thousand dollars worth of our time investing. <coughs> so the small spill process is very similar to the large one. It's basically the same same process, just scale down. We use the same methods for calculations. We use the same models and the same habitat frequency <coughs> analysis. Typically, fewer people are involved, um, and there's a much simpler response structure. It's scalable, just like the response structure is too. And typically, the stakes are lower. And because of that, cooperative damage assessment is, is a lot less likely. Most of your mom and pop small spill spillers don't have the pocketbook to go out and hire consultant terms to come and do a cooperative. You know, they usually just rely on us to come up with something that we uh, work it out that way. Typically, there's a lot less data collection going on, and typically, uh, quite a faster time to settle. So, uh, coordination in a small spill response. Uh, often, there are fewer entities involved, but communication is still, and coordination is, is absolutely clear. Uh, we have to coordinate with enforcement, the local district attorney, or other prosecutors. Sometimes there's certain prosecutors who get involved in these cases, but most of the time, it's a local district. Hospital and our e staff uh, help in, in, in all that process as, as is hospital legal. And often we'll have our, our field biologists, either hospital or just mainline CDFW uh, biologists, 
help assess the, the habit. So where does that money go? Restoration. You're at that point. Um, small spill claims usually get pooled with uh, other small spills. So, uh, a typical small spill isn't going to generate enough money to implement uh, a restoration project in and of itself. Doing a whole project is, is very involved and, and very expensive. So almost always we're looking to pool that money with some other funds to make uh, uh, even a small project uh, doable and implementable. So we'll walk through a quick example. Gil Sizer Sloop. Uh, I think this was one of Matt Fontaine's cases. And uh, it, was a, it was in the valley, a uh, mud bottom sloop, very shallow, narrow sloop. And it was a trucking spill, 1,500 gallons of gasoline we were, we were uh, spilled from a, a truck accident. The investigation found dead fish near his dorm frame, uh, bleeding from the gills. And I may refer to this later, uh, tomorrow you're going to talk about. Effects of poor wildlife, you know, toxic objects to have a and bleeding from the gills may come up when we talk about salvation. But uh, anyway, the biologist found uh, dead fish near the storm drain now ledging to the, the uh, gill sized or slough. So, step one was a biologist walked the length of the slough and found how far down the shooting went and identified that there were dead fish for 5.7 miles. You want to find that out for us? Then she wrote up the uh, supplemental report memo uh, and estimated the degree of injury, which in, in her uh, report was uh, pretty much 100% loss of everything uh, for that 5.7 miles. She used her best conventional judgment to estimate a recovery time. These kind of small spill cases, we don't typically want to stay on scene, measure, and monitor for three, four years. Uh, that just doesn't cut some loud. And it mostly bothers the system. So what was, what was injured in this case? Aquatic resources, shallow bottom of slew habitat. 5.7 miles of it, that's how much. Uh, nearly 100% loss. Basically, the biologist returned everywhere she went after 5.7 miles. This gasoline, because it was such a narrow slew, had killed everything. And we talked, so a couple of the previous speakers have talked about how gasoline is actually one of the more acutely toxic uh, fractions of petroleum. And that's definitely true. So it doesn't take long for pure, pure gas to kill a lot of things in a little industry. Uh, and for how long? Approximately three years based on biologist test for professional So generally speaking, smaller uh, spill cases end up with smaller settlements. They have much more limited data collection. Typically, they're faster to settle. Uh, but we still have coordination challenges. We still have to you know, coordinate with RP enforcement aspects and make sure that the EA is getting all the information they need. Uh, so in summary, NRDA process, we covered, we covered a lot of the methodologies, how they apply to not just large bills, but also the small spills. We talked about some of the challenges in large bills, as well as in small spills. And we talked several times about how the goal is in this restoration. So um, here's our happy little group here. Mike Anderson is our supervisor. We all work for him, except Kathy, I guess she works for us for me. Uh, and any of those phone numbers are good contacts if you have it, and where you believe that to be warranted. Uh, there are a couple other people here who work mainly just on the restoration side. <coughs> Nikki Lake, right here, and Dennis. They tend to do more of the restoration side of things, but uh, you can call any, any of you need to call Mike or any of the four, uh, actually five of us, I'm here, staff. Here. 